Um, we're reading from James 1, 17 through 18, and Hebrews 13, 5b through 6, 8, and through 9a. Every good part and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly light, who does not change like shifting shadows. He, cho he chose to give us birth through the word, word of truth that we might be a kind of first, first fruits for, for all he created. Create. God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. It is good for our hearts to be strengthened by grace. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Thank you. Amen. 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 shy like that? You've never seen the cuckoo shy before. That's a, that's a new thing. I guess he's doing a new thing. St. Ignatius of Loyola, the founder of the Jesuits, said, it is, a, it is dangerous to make everyone go forward by the same road, and worse, to measure others by yourself. That being the case, please allow me, like usual, to take a different road, to share a different point of view of the God of the Old Testament. Suddenly I'm loud. God did not change. God's plan between the Old Testaments and the New Testaments was absolutely the same. God always has dealt with people based upon grace and faith. God used ritual and sacrifice to teach the need for faith and grace. It has always been God's desire that, as we permit, for God to change our hearts and that this will also then change how we live. We can worship God all day long and all night long with our lips. And if our heart is not truly worshiping God, then our actions and words are false. Psalm 78, verses 35 to 37 says this, And they remembered that God was their rock, and the high God their redeemer. Nevertheless, they, flat, they did flatter him with their mouth, and lied unto him with their tongues, for their heart was not right with him neither would they steadfast in his covenant. If we can only pick one thing between the choice of whether um, we are going to walk perfectly or whether we're going to be perfect with God, what choice should we make? Should we walk perfect or should our hearts be perfect? If we can only pick one thing, I believe that God prefers that our hearts be honest with Him. I've often had people who would tell me, like what Bailey said, they would say they're mad with God. And I would then recommend to them that they go ahead and tell God about that. Have that conversation. I said, I, I doubt you'll win the argument, but it's a good conversation to have. I think it's really important in my life, and it may work for you as well, that what's really going on is what I need to show God and talk to God about. To just be honest with God about what's going on, even when what's going on is not very flattering. Even when I'm not living up to 
what my standard is. This idea is found throughout the Old Testament. One other place is in Joel, the second chapter, verses 12 and 13. Now therefore, says the Lord, turn to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping and mourning. So rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and he relents from doing harm. God calls us to act in our hearts rather than to make a show of repentance. Psalm 51, 16 through 17 says, well, that it isn't if we are a pastor or a preacher or a worship leader or a choir member or if we fast once a week, but it's what is going on in our hearts. For you do not desire sacrifice or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise. God will not look down on the person who comes to him in tears, tears over their need, tears over their sin, tears over the suffering of others, people with a broken heart. What does Hosea chapter 6 and verse 6 tell us that God desires to see from us? For I desire mercy and not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. Knowing God, we will know that he rejoices when we act with mercy towards others. That is so much more important to act with mercy than to give up something for God. I can talk to you at some point, I won't do it today, but I can talk to you some way, someday about fasting where you're still allowed to eat steak and chocolate. Let's keep going and see if grace is what God shows in the Old Testament. In Micah, the sixth chapter, verses 6 through 8 teach us, With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, ten thousand rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgressions, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has shown you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? But to do justly, to love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. You know, since I've been out, I've been tempted here and there, and periodically, when in California, I bought lottery tickets. I think it would be a marvelous thing if I would win the lottery. You know, oftentimes, uh, we've speculated on what we would do. Colleen, the last time we bought tickets, assured people she would quit her job that very day. <laughs> you know, we have various different things that we would do with that. But the truth is, if we had millions of dollars, God would rather that we act with mercy towards others more so than spend that million in ways that would be good. God wants us to show mercy, to show kindness, to show that thing that we would like to have. While we're in Micah, let's go one more chapter and look at Micah 7, verses 18 to 19. Who is a God like you? pardoning iniquity, and passing over the transgression of the remnant of his heritage. He does not retain his anger forever, because he delights in mercy. He will again have compassion on us, and will subdue our iniquities. You will cast all our sins into the depth of the sea. God is all about that stuff of pardoning and mercy. I know one of the biggest problems I have in life is me. 
I have often said, and you've probably heard it, that my favorite prayer is, God, deliver me from me. So many times I find that I have not lived up to what I think I should do. Not mention what other people think I should do, but I haven't lived up to my own standard of what is right and wrong. I find that I have failed. And then I want to go through that whole thing of feeling guilty and, you know, wondering how long before I'm not guilty again. I knew a man a long time ago. He, he died probably 20 years ago now, um, Herman Francis Nelson. And he used to make fun of me. He was a bishop, and he would make fun of me. He would say, well, how long should you not get any mail because of that attitude? How long should God deprive you of this? And then he would say, that's not what God is doing. God is wanting us to recognize when we are not showing mercy and then show mercy. Not pay a penalty for when we were wrong, but to instead move forward and do what is right. His mercy endures forever. God will always have compassion on us. Even in the Old Testament, Testament, Micah was written about 750 B.C., Hosea about 785 B.C., and Joel around 800 B.C. Even then, God was calling for grace and not legalism. Long before Jesus was born in the flesh, God was calling for grace, that we would treat ourselves with grace, that we would treat others with grace, and that we would know that doing so is more important than following the rules, especially the rules of religion that keep us from showing the kindness that God wants. The world, I, I've just noticed so many places, and in so many different courses I've taken and things, that they want to talk about the God of the Old Testament versus the God of the New Testament, like, you know, God got saved somewhere after uh, Malachi and, and changed what he was into and decided he was going to do some new thing. And I would say, well, you didn't read the Psalms that were written about 1000 B.C. I remember there was a time when I thought that it was bit important for me in my life that I would chant the whole book of Psalms every week. You know, I was busy trying to be a Benedictine. And so here I was in prison getting up early in the morning. You know, and of course, they controlled the lights. So you had to find that one little place where you could get your Bible out there. And you could see enough so that silently in my head I could chant the Psalms. And I hated Thursday because it was Psalm, you know, uh, <laughs> 119, you know, all 176 verses. It was the toughest day of the week, you know. Uh, but, you know, I thought that this was something I was doing to, to be right with God. And eventually I figured out that that was really kind of the height of silliness in my life. That was David just being about as dumb as David can be. But God wants something different from us. He wants us to receive mercy and to give mercy. To expect kindness, especially from ourselves. You know the book of Obadiah. I know people read Obadiah and they wonder what it's about. It's really about Esau and Jacob. And it's about we are Esau and Jacob. You know, we are both of those. You know, we are, we are punishing one part of ourselves and uh, uh, rewarding another part of ourselves when actually God calls us to have mercy even on that part of ourselves that we're not very happy with. In those times where the day has been tough and we can't, just can't be kind to others and we're usually at that point even worse to ourselves, God calls us to be merciful to ourselves as well. The world always wanted to make that, that point that all that happened in the Old Testament was all this, this slaying going on, all the smiting that was happening, 
And this was all that was going on in the Old Testament, where in reality, the Old Testament speaks of what the mission of Jesus would be throughout the Old Testament, speaks about what is coming. And then the New Testament, of course, is Christ revealed. God has always been in their mercy business. God always calls upon us to show mercy. If I could go back a little bit further and show God's mercy, we could go back to that famous case of, uh, you know, Cain and Abel. You know, we could go back to that case. I don't know what it would have been the people versus Cain or what the court case would have been styled as, you know. But in that case, do you realize that even though the law at the time was one of retribution, he was not sentenced to die. He was set forth and was marked. And he was marked not so people would know that he had sinned, so that people would do nothing to him in retribution. God called for mercy all the way back there in the early part of Genesis. In Zechariah, the seventh chapter, verses 8 and 9, written about 520 B.C., I think Dave was there, but I didn't come, I wasn't there yet. Uh, It says this, Then the word of the Lord came to Zechariah, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Execute true justice. Show mercy and compassion, every one to his brother. Do not oppress the widow or the fatherless, the alien or the poor. Let none of you plan evil in his heart against his brother. Staying in Zechariah, in Chapter 8, verses 16 and 17, it says, These are the things you shall do. Speak each man the truth to his neighbor. Give judgment in your gates for truth, justice, and peace. Let none of you think evil in your heart against your neighbor, and do not love a false oath, for these are the things that I hate, says the Lord. How do we manage to live like this? How do we change? Zechariah 4, 6 says says it like it was in 520 B.C. and the way it still is. So he answered and said to me, This is the word of the Lord for Zerubbabel, not, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. We do not use our power. We do not rely on our strength. We rely on God's Spirit. How many times have you tried to be good? I know so many times I've tried to be good. Sometimes it works for a while. Just get really stubborn and tends to work for a while. Goes for a little bit. And then about the time that I think I'm doing really good, Boom, I'm face down in the mud again. I've managed to blow it. I've managed to to just miss something and fail to do what I know is the right thing for me to do. Because it is not by my strength. And when I try to make it something about me, there I am imposing law upon myself rather than relying on God's grace. Rather than relying on God to show me how and to lead me that way. The Hebrew word for grace uh, is Cain, spelled differently than Cain and Abel, meaning grace, and it appears in the Old Testament at least 66 times. We rely on God and ask God to bathe us in His grace. God's grace does not run out. About 588 B.C., about 2,600 years ago, Jeremiah in Lamentations 3, 21 to 26, encourages us today by declaring, This I recall to my mind, therefore I have hope. Through the Lord's mercies we are not consumed, 
because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul, therefore I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. It is good that one should hope and wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. Bruno Barnhart expressed that once we accept Jesus into our life, his spirit dwells in us and we become the temple of God. The Sabbath of God surrounds us like a garment throughout the week. We are made new people. The same idea was expressed by King David in Psalm 22, which was written about 1000 BC. In our struggle in life, we seem to have that constant tension between good and evil. You know, you're doing really good. You, you seem like you're doing well. And then you find you're watching the news and you don't have very kind thoughts for anything you see on the news. We know we go through life and we don't live up to our own standards. I'm very much a proponent in the idea that I don't need to tell people what their sin is. I would rather them tell me because I know they know. I know that they're aware. I don't need to tell them that. What I need to tell them is God loves them. God loves them and has called all of us to care for each other, no matter where we're at in life. I've done a lot of work with people uh, recovering from addictions, and you'd see some guy come back into the program where he had just had a relapse, and he'd come in with his head just bowed down and feeling all ashamed, and I would say to him, the only shame there could be is in not trying again. Stand up again. If it was easy, Everybody would have already done it. It's not easy. Stand up again. Lean on us. For the opposite of addiction is connection. The opposite of so many of our problems lies in just understanding the care that others have for us. And almost more important and probably more important that others allow us to care for them so that they value us enough that they value our caring and our love for them. We see this struggle in the history of Israel throughout the Old Testament. What do we do in the midst of this struggle? The co-founder of the Jesuits, you can see I have a lot of Jesuit background in me, I guess, uh, Peter Favre, the co-founder of Jesuits, advises us to do this. Seek grace in the smallest things, and you will also find grace to accomplish. To believe in and to hope for the greatest things. If we will just look for grace in the little things, the sparrow on the razor wire, the number of times each of us has looked out that window and just looked and picked out something. The joy of some little thing out there. If we will look for the grace in those little things, we will begin to find the grace in the larger things. In looking for God in all things, the big and the little, and in the in-between, we find the strength to believe, the presence of hope, and we will accomplish great things. Marie Swan wrote, Locked within each heart is a dream waiting to be born. Today, let us renew our intention to seek God in everything, and including those dreams. I wrote a series of books, and somebody asked me, they said, what is, what's your basis for this, really? And I said, it's really about dream prayer. It's where I take my dreams and I lay them before God. And I invest that hope that one day these dreams will come about. And watching and seeing how God changes the dreams 
over time in ways that I like, that God improves upon the dreams. And then slowly watching the dream come about. I encourage each one of you to have a dream, to look at that dream and to look how can I take a step towards achieving that dream. To asking God, how can I make that first step towards making this dream real? How can I get out of this place that I'm not happy about being in? And share that dream with others as well. People like dreamers who are trying to achieve the dream. When we talk bad about dreamers, it's somebody who's not doing anything. They're just dreaming. But I encourage you to dream and then seek help getting that dream to come real, to reach out to others, to share that dream, to look for that encouragement, to look for that grace. Let us join with God to pursue that dream, keeping in mind what God says to us in Ezekiel 36, verses 25 and 26. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. God has always been the God of mercy and love. God is flowing into and through us, and he will save us from the world and how it has soiled us, how it has really just damaged our abilities to hope and our ability just to enter each day believing that we're going to see the goodness of the Lord here in the land of the living. God will give us a tender and hopeful heart and call us to share in all that there is. Remember your dreams, your hopes. Talk about them and expect to see the goodness of the Lord here in the land of the living.